are delighted that you're here. Actually, we are delighted that you have been here for the last four weeks, and this is our concluding session. Uh, I think that this uh, Linton Lecture Series has just been very edifying for all of us. So I'm glad you're here. Yes. Yes, you may clap. Um, I get to introduce Jim Edwards. How many of you here went to confirmation class with Jim Edwards? There, I know there are some. You just don't want to admit it. But uh, people have come up to me and told me that. Uh, Jim uh, and Jane were here from 1971 to 1978. I like to say, because I am the center of my surrounding universe, I like to say that when it became clear that we were leaving, that's when Jim came. And when it became clear that we were coming back, that's when he left. <laughs> but... I wish we had uh, had overlapping times. Uh, Jim's teaching is just marvelous. It is full of depth. It is full of love for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And his influence over his last decades of ministry and teaching has just been wide and far ranging. Um, he has been at Whitworth College as a professor of New Testament. He's now professor emeritus from Whitworth. He was here as an associate pastor. He has been the author of several commentaries that are quite, quite useful. He's written commentaries on the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, and on Paul's letter to the Romans. I have used both Mark and Luke, and this is what I as a pastor think. So I'm giving you a grade right now, Jim. Okay, this sort of uh, shoes on the other foot now. Um, Jim's scholarship is second to none in his uh, commentaries, but he doesn't just leave it with his scholarship. What he writes in his commentaries is so helpful for teachers and preachers of those gospels that uh, they are entirely fully edifying. He is a skilled teacher. And I just want to close the introduction of Jim by reading something from an interview you gave uh, when you were interviewed about the gospel of Luke. And this will give you insight into uh, Jim's approach. Now, I wrote it in my own handwriting, so I hope I can read it to you. Um, but this is what he said uh, about uh, his approach to writing his commentary on the Gospel of Luke. And this is quoting Jim. I am deeply impressed how deeply the Gospel writers believed that Jesus is the Son of God who lived and walked among mortals and introduced them to the liberating joy of the kingdom of God. And my mission as a commentator is simply rightfully and fully to expound and exhibit the gospel to which the Holy Spirit bears saving witness in the world. And so I think understanding that about Jim, you understand that we are going to be truly, truly blessed tonight. So let's open with prayer before Jim comes up. Lord God, thank you so much for gathering us here tonight. We pray that your Holy Spirit would guide Jim as he speaks to us and that your Holy Spirit would equip us with ears to hear. Bless us through all the events of this evening. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Junior. That was called great inflation. You know what that is? I, I like that quote. Um, I didn't understand it. But, well, I can't read that. So, um, okay. It's a pleasure for me to be here and the, um, running the, the last lap of this Lenten service on uh, the Gospels and Love and John. So my subject this evening, which was assigned to me, um, is love in the Johannine literature. Now, I don't like to use that word Johannine literature because it sounds very academic, but what it means is we have four, five documents actually in the New Testament that bear the name of John and 
probably the same person, or if not the same person, certainly the same school. The Gospel of John, then three letters, one, two, three, and then the book of Revelation. All of these claim the name of John. So rather than listing them off each time, I just use the word, the Johannine literature. I don't mean to be snooty about that, but it's just a simple way to comprise them all together. So our subject is love in the Johannine literatures. Two weeks ago, Junior um, gave us some definitions of love from the new authorities of our age, artificial intelligence, which we hear so much about. And it's kind of odd that people who are capable of love would need to learn from a machine what love is, but so be it. That's the world we live in. And one of these definitions said that love is a deep and profound feeling of affection. And I got the feeling that you all kind of like that. And a second one was that love is a genuine affection second time of affection there, and devotion to religious experience. So one of them is a feeling of affection. The other one, it is a devotion and religious experience. Now I wonder what you really think about this because you all are um, experienced in love. It's a very rare thing that we get this many people together to hear a talk on any subject in which every one of you, in one sense, is an expert on the subject already. Well, if you're not experts, you're not fools about love. Because we have all had experiences, either with love or without it, misfires of it. And so we have our own views on really what love is about. And I want to ask you, do you think those are adequate definitions, a feeling of affection, a devotion to religious experience? And then the second question, are these adequate to the gospel's teaching on love? The most famous chapter in the Bible on love is not from John, it's from Paul. It's from 1 Corinthians 13. Um, how many of you had it read at your, your wedding? Yeah. It's read at many weddings. It's, uh, it calls love the greatest of the Christian virtues. 1 Corinthians 13 is a source of hope and consolation. Whenever you read it, if you're down, if you're discouraged, if you're angry, you read that chapter and it really gets you back onto the bubble. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Whew. That's a good one. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice when things go bad. It rejoices in truth. Love bears all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends, says Paul. You can't read even a section of that chapter without feeling more important about the task of being a Christian human being. Paul portrays love as a virtue. A virtue is a character trait. It's the kind of things that Schools used to try to teach. Families used to try to inculcate. Scouts and churches used to try to, and hopefully they still do. Patience, kindness, rejoicing in truth, not being envious or resentful, 
constant bearing up positiveness. Well, our subject today is not love in Paul, it's, it's love in the Johannine literature. But I want to compare John with Paul in this respect because there's an important difference. Both Paul and John use the word agape, and agape is the Greek noun for love. The verb is agape, an. I'll use that some. So I'm not mispronouncing when I say an. Agape an is the Greek verb. Agape is the Greek noun. Both John and Paul use the agape family about a hundred times each in their bodies of literature, the Pauline letters and the Johannine letters. About the equal number of times. Paul also used, or John also uses another word, however, 13 times. That's uh, in the love family called philane. We use the word filial affection. And philane is usually seen as a, a slightly weaker form of love, friendship perhaps. So John uses this too. But nevertheless, uh, they use this reference to love about the same number of times. But with one very significant difference. Two-thirds of Paul's uses of love are nouns. And for John, same number of times, 100, 125 times, two-thirds of his uses of love are verbs. Paul, two-thirds are nouns. John, two-thirds are verbs. And what's the difference? Well, a verb or a noun is a description of the state of things, the nature of things. Nouns are words in stasis. They're, they're fixed. They're immovable. Verbs are action words. Nouns talk about realities that don't change. Verbs talk about actions that make things happen. And so when John makes this interesting shift in vocabulary to use a verb to talk about the Christian virtue of love in two-thirds of his instances, he's telling us something very important. That this is not so much a trait as a description of a behavior and the way one lives. Now, John does something very similar with another word. Uh, it's not the word agapon or agape. It's the word for believe. When you look at the word for believe in the Gospels and the epistles of John, it occurs 98 times. And in 97 of those times, it is a verb, believe. Only one time in the entire Johannine corpus is it a noun called faith. That's 1 John chapter 5. This is the victory that overcomes the world, your faith. That's the only time that John uses the word for believe as a noun. And what does this tell us? This tells us that in the Johannine literature, the, the body of the New Testament that's our subject tonight, that the two greatest virtues, faith and love, believing and loving, are activities. They are behaviors. They describe not who we are, but the way we live and act and decide and influence people in the world. For 
Paul, faith is something you are. For John, faith and love are something that you do. The Johannine literature speaks of love in three ways, and we want to divide this talk into that. The first one is, what does it say about God's love? Secondly, we ask the question, what does it say about the love of Jesus Christ? And thirdly, what does it say about the love that we as Christians are tutored and responsible for? Love is a characteristic of God. God is love. He uses the word agape. That's 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. This is the most marvelous declaration that can be made about God. And its rarity is remarkable in the world of religions. Christianity is in a family of religions of Jews and Muslims because our great, great, great grandfather is the same. We all go back to Abraham. But it's interesting that neither the Old Testament Judaism nor the Islamic world call God love. The Old Testament on occasion, not very often, declares that God does love. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, it's a beautiful chapter, incidentally. You may want to look at that, especially when you go home. Uh, talking about God asked, the, the, the Israelites say, why, why did God choose us among all the people of the world? Because we're not the most powerful, we're not the most numerous, we don't uh, occupy the most important part of the globe. They ask this question, why does God choose us? And that's a question that I think that we all ask if we are really impressed by the humility of being Christians. And in the seventh chapter of Deuteronomy, we're told that God chose Israel not because it was more numerous, but simply because he loved you and chose you. Um, and if you ask yourself as a Christian, why am I a Christian and some am, I'm not? The people that I do love, maybe in my own family or not. It's a very difficult question to answer. Most of us are not going to say, well, it's because I deserve to be and my sister doesn't. Or my parents or my kids. Um, it's just a profound mystery that for reasons known only to God, we have been the recipients to his love. And we know that we're unworthy of it, but we're grateful nevertheless. And in one or two other instances where we are told in the Old Testament that God is love, it's interesting that this love is approached from the model of a marriage. God is seen to be this um, metaphoric husband of Israel. So in the book of Isaiah... God speaks as a husband of his everlasting love and compassion for Israel, his spouse. And this same husband-wife relationship shows up even clearer in Hosea because the first three chapters of Hosea begin with Hosea's wife who was a wonderful woman who becomes a whore, prostitute. And she defects. And Hosea asks this question, what should I do? Should I leave her? Should I dump her? Should I uh, divorce her? And for all of the good reasons that he has, what is he? he comes back and says, I cannot do that. I have got to have her back. And Hosea then projects this onto God. This is the way God looks at Israel. This faithless spouse that should be dumped, but cannot be? And the answer is, why can it not? The, the question is, why can it not be? And the answer is what? Because I love her. 
Now, those are tender and beautiful images. And they're powerful, but they're very rare in the Old Testament. Almost no other authors speak about the love of Yahweh. <clears throat> now, when we go to the other sister religion in Islam, it's no different. In fact, it might even be bleaker. The Quran has 99 epithets, words, titles for God, and one of them is all loving. I think it's 46 or 43. Mateen, he knows all of this stuff. He can tell you, correct you on all of this. It says, uh, God is all loving. But there's very little emphasis in the Quran on the love of God. Uh, in Surah 11, he's called loving. In Surah 85, he's called kindly, beneficent. But the loving nature of Allah and the loving expression of it in the life of Muslims is, plays a minor role compared to the major emphases upon Allah's oneness, sovereignty, and omnipotence. Now, those terms resound in the Quran not love. The same is true in the Old Testament. So when we come to the New Testament, we see an emphasis upon the characteristic of love that is wholly novel. I might say one other thing. It's oftentimes said that Buddhism has a similar view of the love of God but it really isn't the similar view because Buddhism has a view of God's, what would be, we might call benevolence. And that is to say um, that the, the gods or the goal of life is to have this kind of detached beneficence. It's not dragged into everyday life, but it is a detached feeling of well-being. Now, that is a great deal different, as you're going to discover in this talk, from the New Testament emphasis on love. The New Testament defines God's activity in the world as an expression of love. It defines God's activity in this world not as an expression of power, not as an expression of justice and law, not as an expression of retribution, but as an expression of love. God loves the world. God loves his son, Jesus Christ. And God has expressed his love. See, God doesn't just feel love, nor just think love, nor just intend love. God demonstrates love by sending his beloved son into the world for its redemption. There's that activeness. This is something God acts on. And we can judge that action as a loving act or as a hateful act on the basis of the action alone. First John chapter four, and I'm gonna quote a lot from first John chapter four. You should go home tonight or tomorrow at the latest and read that chapter. You'll wanna read it two or three times. It is just Dynamite, it's a bad word to use for love. It is just <laughs> heart throbbing, better, uh, for its richness in love. And here's how Paul, or how John says it. This is how God has made known his love for us. He just, that doesn't say it. He's going to give us an experience that we can judge for ourselves. This is how God has made known his love for us. He sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. God's love consists in this, not that 
we have loved God, but that he himself has loved us and sent his son into the world as an atonement for our sins. What a powerful verse. Not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us. God's love is not disinterested. It's not impersonal. It's not this detached benevolence that we see in the Buddha. It is particular, it's powerful, and it's expressed in the life of his son, Jesus Christ. We love God because God first loved us. We're not the source of the love. Love is not something we have to pump up like we inflate a tire. It is something we receive and then pass on. Where do we receive it? From the only source of true love, from God, as expressed in his son, Jesus Christ. We derive our love. We do not manufacture it. We derive it from God. In John chapter 17, this is this high priestly prayer in which Jesus prays before his crucifixion. And it's a conversation with God. And in this conversation, he starts to talk about we. And it's God, his Father, and then the Holy Spirit. And so there is a conversation going on among the Trinity. And then as we come to the end of John 17, we find that actually there's now a fourth party that's being inducted into this conversation. Who's that fourth party? It's you and me. It's believers. Here's how it goes. I am in them, Jesus prays, for this, this divine love relationship to induct us. To be inducted is to be included in something officially. I am in them and you are in me so that they, it's talking about us, that's you and me as Christians, so that they might be fulfilled as one with us. Have you ever actually thought about that? That this prayer, you, you have trouble with the Trinity. Well, how about the quaternity? You're part of it. In this way, the world will know that you have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved me. And so John tells us that God loves the son, but he also tell, the son tells us that he loves you as he loves the son. The most defining characteristic of God's love is declared in the most famous verse in the New Testament. John 3, 16. I'm sure you all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Gave. Didn't think. Didn't intend. Didn't plan to. <laughs> didn't wish he had. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish. No statement here about judgment this is a rescue operation. Would not perish. That's the alternative to salvation is perishing. But have everlasting life. I want to bring two salient truths about John 3.16. We're so familiar with this verse. Let that familiarity put roots into your life. Don't let it become colorless and meaningless for you. The first truth of John 3.16 is its absolute counterintuitivity. This is the last thing that if we did not know the gospel, we would ever imagine about God. When you look at the world, its harshness, its cruelty, 
its lack of fidelity, its violence, its brutality. The world is a terribly difficult place in which to seek to be a moral person. Not just because everyone else sucks. We <laughs> are perhaps the greatest problem of all. John 3.16 is utterly flabbergasting. God loves the world. He does not bemoan it. Although he has every reason to. He redeems the world. He buys it back. That's what redemption means. It was mine at one time. It defected. I want it back. He doesn't say to the world, good riddance. I'm glad I got rid of you. He redeems it. He doesn't reduce it to ash. God sacrifices his son for this world. He does not sacrifice the world in anger. The good news of the gospel is hard to believe simply because this kind of love is so unexpected, so undeserved, and so unfamiliar in our lives. This is a re revolutionary truth. It is a divine offensive that offends us. It's oftentimes called a scandal. A scandal is something that offends. When I was a professor at Jamestown College, where I went to teach after I was the youth minister here in the 70s. One of my students entered the Elie Wiesel ethics writing contest. Got 5,000 bucks if you could write this contest on an ethical issue for today. And my student, Kimlin Bender, wrote an, an, an essay on the... Lord, on the uh, um, a novel at the time, the uh, story about the flies. Lord the, Lord of the Flies, yeah. And he, Kimlin won the uh, essay. There were 500 essays and he, he won from Jamestown, North Dakota. And so he, Wiesel invited him back to receive his check to the Yale Club in New York City. And he said, you can bring your supervising professor along if you want. And I was Kimlin's supervising professor. So he said, would you like to come? I said, yeah, I'll come. I've read, I think, all of Elie Wiesel's books. And uh, I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk with him. So we're up there on about the 20th floor. Thank you. And Wiesel comes in, and he's very cordial and we talk and, and uh, everybody else kind of takes off and I said, do you uh, mind if I ask you a question? He said, no, I'd be glad to. And I said, uh, I, I think I've read all of your books and I'm very moved by them, but I, I think you have a theme that goes through every single one of your books, if I'm not mistaken. He says, oh yeah. He says, what's that? I said, well, I, the theme that I, the way I would put it is, um, in all your books, you have this theme, never forget and never forgive. And he said, yeah, that is exactly right. Congratulated me for being a good reader. <laughs> and then um, he said very bluntly, do you have a problem with that? And I was not really wanting to jump into the deep end quite so quickly. I wasn't quite sure how to respond to that. Uh, I said, well, I, I suppose I do. And he said, well, why would that be? And I said, well, I am a, I'm a Christian. And the gospel tells me that Jesus Christ has died for our sins and that they, are, in fact, are forgiven. Wiesel very 
clearly, very bluntly, said to me, that's why you're a Christian and I'm a Jew. It was not proud. It was not vindictive. It was factual. He rejected the idea that forgiveness for some sins is either a human possibility or a necessity or both. For us, that is the gospel. It is a scandal of grace. And you're sitting there confessing Christ and me standing here proclaiming Christ is the chief example of that scandal. The second salient truth is that in the kerygma, the New Testament proclamation of the gospel, that's what the word kerygma means, God's love is rarely the first thing that's said about God. Take the gospel of John as an example. We have this powerful prologue in the first 18 verses. Oh, the whole history of salvation is there. Then we have John introducing the disciples in the remainder of chapter one. And then in chapter two, we have the guzzling wedding feast at Cana. We have the clearing of the temple. Tim has been preaching on these texts. Then we have in chapter three, that famous dialogue between Nicodemus comes at night so he won't be seen in Jesus. It's not until John 3.16 that God's love is mentioned. For God so loved the world. And it's mentioned as an explanation for everything that has been said so far. Ah, so that's why he treats Nicodemus this way. So that's about the wedding of Canaan. Ah, so that explains the prologue. It's held until there's possibility to fill it with content that you understand as opposed to false content. And in the Apostle Paul, it's even more pronounced. I think that Romans is the most compelling exposition of the gospel that's ever been written. Paul begins Romans with a salutation, first 15 verses. He then has this summary of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. The Jews and Greek goes on to say it. Then he goes into this, oh, this just battering description of human sin. The end of chapter one, all of chapter two, up through chapter three. Then he comes to the end of chapter three with these 11 verses that are just atomic in their power. The entire gospel is right there. The whole gospel is there at the end of chapter three. And then in chapter four, he talks about Abraham. And he says, the first example of justification by faith is Abraham. It's how it was meant to be from the very beginning and it's never changed. Not until chapter five, nearly one third of the way through Romans, in which Paul is trying to say everything important about the gospel that needs to be said. Not until then does he mention the word love. Why? Because if we don't talk about the content of love, then we will misunderstand the nature of love. Love is very rarely the first good word to say about God. It's very rarely the first good word because love is so easily misunderstood in our culture. It almost promises to give the wrong concepts and understandings to the minds of people who don't have information 
by which to judge it. If you like baseball, love is not a good leadoff batter. Love, you should put it number four in the lineup. <laughs> Clean up batter. Let your men get on or players get on base first, then put love up to bat. That's how you'll score. Love of Jesus Christ. The New Testament reveals Jesus not as a feeling or as an idea, but as the incarnation of God's love. Incarnation means enfleshment, the becoming human. Jesus tells his disciples that he loves the Father and that he loves the disciples with the same love that he loves the Father. The Last Supper, he eagerly expresses his love for the disciples. When the hour had come, Jesus gathered the disciples whom he loved in the world to the end he loved them, John 13. At the end of the meal, he gave his disciples a new commandment that they were to love one another as he had loved them. The supreme manifestation of God's love is the self-sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Once again, back to John 1, 1 John 4. In this is love, not that we ourselves have loved God, but that he, God himself, loved us and sent his son as an atonement for our sins. Whenever the cross of Christ is mentioned in John, it's always mentioned as an expression of God's agape love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have ever lasting life. Now, John has far more to say about love for us as disciples than he does about love with regard to God or Jesus Christ. Agape love characterizes Jesus' followers just as it does Jesus. And there is both a vertical dimension, that is to say, our love for God, and there's a horizontal dimension, our love for each other. And here's what John tells us, that horizontal love dimension is far more important than the vertical dimension. Or let me put it otherwise, there is far more teaching about the horizontal description of love than the vertical. There is one about the vertical. Uh, it begins at the end of John in chapter 21, that famous dialogue that Jesus has with Peter. After Peter has denied Jesus, Jesus sees him after the resurrection beside the Sea of Galilee, and he asks Peter if he loves him. He asks him three times, and it is a, a very quizzical uh, conversation because Jesus says twice, Peter, do you love me? And the word that he uses for love is the word agapon, agape. And Peter both times answered, yes, Lord, I love you. But Peter does not use the same word for love. In your English translations, it is the same, but in the Greek, it's not. In Greek, it's the word philane. And we don't know how to understand and interpret this. Normally, the word filial love is a step lower. I talked about this before. Then agape love. Agape love is this self-giving love. Love without any conditions to it. Filial love is much more of a friendship type of love. So Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Agape. Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you, Philae. Ugh. Twice he does this, and then finally Jesus says, third time, Peter, do you, he uses the word filling, are you my friend, Peter? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I am your friend. Peter never once uses the word agape. Now, how do we understand that? 
Well, the answer is nobody knows. But here's one way to understand it. And that is that Jesus is willing to accept whatever love you are able to give. Perhaps Peter is honest enough to say, Jesus, I cannot give you selfless love. Will you take the best that I can give? And Jesus said, that's a deal. Now, this is one of the only times in the gospel where we have this vertical relationship, the love of believers for God. In John, it's almost always not the question whether you love God, but the question, how you love others. Christian love is most frequently defined as a love for other human beings. And here I think our AI definitions of love as a feeling of affection or a religious experience really fail us. This is not the kind of love that the Gospel of John teaches. The kind of love that the Gospel teaches and declares to us are behaviors that can be experienced by other people. And the first is the love for others. There's a host of passages. I've given a number of them to you. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. That's how you must love one another. We have this commandment from him, that the one who loves God also loves his brother. In a most beautiful expression, love for others is described as a bringing to perfection of God's love in us. Beloved, let us love one another for God is love and if we love others, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. I, I know of almost no other passage in scripture that talks about reaching a state of ideal discipleship. We're also aware of how seemingly impossible that is, how out of reach. But John actually says here, this is how it is perfected, through agape love. John is adamant about love for the other. It occurs more often in his teaching than any other single reference. The difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. Whoa. There's a lead in. <laughs> he doesn't just say the difference between true love and near true love. The difference between true love and liking someone. The difference between true love and tolerating someone. Here it comes. If you want the two alternatives, the children of God and the children of the evil one, the answer to which you belong to is determined by what word? Love. The difference between the children of God and the children of the devil is clear. Whoever does not love righteousness Whoever does not love the brother is not of God. Whoever says, I love God and hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love the brother or sister that can be seen cannot love God whom you've never seen. I want you just to Push pause here for a minute and look up. That's such a powerful statement. 
Uh, if you haven't noticed, we live in an election year. <laughs> and you're going to hear a lot more about two subjects. One of them will be about God and how God affirms this political position or this political candidate. And the other one will be a lot of invectives, a lot of malice, and even hatred of other people. Men and women, you are the children of God. Let us grow up and be faithful sons and daughters this year. We cannot hear people saying, we love God, we represent God, and preaching hatred of others. You can't say it. And we, as God's children and this church, should not be confused by it. We should not believe it. We should not participate in it. We should rise above it. You cannot say that you love God and hate another. There are other passages that flesh this out even further. Love is keeping Jesus' word or walking according to his commandments. The Hebrew and Christian world love this word walk as a metaphor of faith because walking, unlike just thinking or talking, is an entire bodily activity. You're actually going somewhere. You're arriving at a goal. And so is faith. Christian love is not about feelings. It's not about intentions. It is about behaviors. Whoever loves me keeps my word. We cannot say we love God and scorn his commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. How do you know that when you love others, you love Jesus Christ? This is how we know if we love the children of God. Whenever we love God and keep his commandments. Love of God is not a feeling. It is the willingness to risk keeping his commandments. Nor is such love beyond human reach. I think this is one of the things that, that the devil or our own hearts and failures and weakness oftentimes use as an excuse not to take seriously the Christian faith. We could never really do it even if we tried. John, 1 John 5, 3 says, and his commandments are not, in the, the Greek word here is barei. This is a very unusual word. The word barei means they're not so heavy that they crush you. It's oftentimes translated, and his commandments are not oppressive. I think that would work. Or you could also say his commandments are not unbearable. That, that would also work. The word means, yeah, it's going to be hard, but it's not impossible. Do it. Christian love is defined in terms of good works. We oftentimes, when we think of love as a feeling, Think that it's not a work. Well, in fact, it is a work. Little ones, let us not love in word only, but in deeds, what we do, and in truth. And it's, and it's helpful to other people, whoever enjoys the goods of this world and sees his fellow believer in need and withholds his compassion from him or her, how can you say that the agape of God abides within that person? Our hands, our tongues, our feet, our arms 
betray or convey our love. And we conclude. Above all, Jesus is demonstrated his love in self-sacrifice for sinners. He calls himself the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sake of the sheep. It's a beautiful image. And of course, it's a prophetic image because that's precisely what he's done for the world. His self-sacrifice is the supreme expression of agape love. And this can be expected of us as his followers. No greater love has this than that one would lay down his life for his friends. We have lived in a world that has been blessed to be largely free of persecution of Christians. I'm not entirely sure it is a blessing, but it is a reality. A few weeks ago, when Alexei Navalny was killed in Russia, I felt so sad and despondent. Perhaps you did too. Here was a light in a very dark place. Here was one of those brave voices. There aren't very many brave voices in this world. that was silenced. So I started looking through my prayer books, hoping to find some prayers for martyrs. I have three books of prayers. And I'm a professor of prayers, so I should know something about this. And in none of these books, there were prayers for every conceivable thing. Graduations, marriages, baptisms, women who are pregnant, men who are getting their first jobs, isn't that? No prayers for martyrs. And I thought to myself, our church has lived in a time in which we have not had to pay for our faith with our lives. And we don't have prayers now that peoples are losing their lives. And we are weakened by the fact that we can't vicariously pray for, participate for an Alexei Navalny. And I don't need to say the obvious. We are living in a world that is no longer as safe as it was before. Martyrdoms are not to be unexpected for those who love and profess Christ. And perhaps that would also make us a stronger and more faithful and perhaps even a more loving church. I'm going to stop right there and allow us to have some conversation. Two questions. Two questions. Number one. Is there a particular verse that we have read today, tonight, that speaks to you personally? Does one of these passages of love resonate with you? Which one and why? Second question. The Gospel of John demystifies love. It demystifies love. And it makes it a very practical expression of faith. It 
it demystifies love and makes it a practical expression of faith. Now, here's my question. Do you think that it's possible to display agape love, the love that characterizes God's love as exhibited in Jesus Christ? Do you think that it's possible to display agape love without knowing it or without intending it? That could be asked in many ways. Do we always have to be conscious of doing something in a loving way for a loving act to be done by us? Talk about those two things. You do have to go home at some point. Uh, now we have time for, if you would raise your hands if you have a question so I can get a feel of where I need to, to roam. Okay, well, Shannon, thanks for being right up front. Actually, this is a kind of question I've had for a while and I even presented it to another presenter who asked me to save it for you. Oh. <laughs> To whom do I owe the thanks? I'm, I would never tell. <laughs> okay. So one of the things I think about when I think about the state of the world is I, I think about how we as a country, not just as the whole world, but as a country, have been walking, running, and jogging away from God as a country. Maybe not the people in this room or at the church down the street, but as a nation, we keep moving further and further away from him and eliminating, eliminating him from day-to-day -day life. And I worry, I don't worry about it a lot, because I, but I think about, is the day going to come when God says, I gave you free will, and look what you're doing with it. Have a good day. I'll see you later. In the form of a question. What do I think about that? I think that's hard. Um, let me just take one pass. It's a humble pass at this, um, <clears throat> this sense that our world is, America is going to hell in the handbasket. That we are consciously and seriously divorcing ourselves from our Christian background. I think we have to be careful here. There are some ways that this is absolutely true, sexual ethics being one. But there are other respects that it's not true. Um, most of us in this room grew up in a world that had pretty segregated churches. Janie and I once went to America's Georgia and were asked to leave a church because we entered with a couple of black kids. We worked with blacks and Puerto Ricans in West Harlem and oftentimes found that the churches were the most segregated places. I think most of us in this room are very happy that that, in our experience, is something of the past. We know that's sinful. And we don't want that for this church. We don't want this for ECO. We don't want this for any Christian community because it's a scandal of shame to judge a person by the color of that person's skin. Something similar could be said about women. Women are inducted into the lives of modern churches today like they never were in the past. So I think in those two respects, rather than saying things suck, no. This is a genuine genuinely important step in more faithful 
social, communal expression of the faith. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have problems in other ways. Truth-telling, human sexuality, um, violence. But I think we need to be discriminating here and not just negative about the state of the world because in these two respects, and I'll bet you that many of you could add others, our Christian experience is preferable today than what it would have been 50 years ago. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Okay, we have a question over here. Actually, uh, for, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, all the study that you put into this. I've learned a number of things tonight, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, two, uh, two questions, brief questions. Uh, you mentioned how uh, both John and uh, Paul wait to introduce the concept of love in their writings. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminded me of uh, the idea of the messianic secret in the Gospel of Mark. Do you yeah. think that the two are, have the same kind of motivation behind them for, for why Jesus refrains from declaring himself Messiah in the way that people uh, might uh, think about him because they have wrong concepts and he wants to wait till he can clarify that. And then the second, you may remember, like I do back in the late 1960s, the song, uh, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. Yeah. And I was thinking back to the, that passage in uh, 1 John 5 about the commandments of God are not burdensome. Yeah. Rei from Baru's heavy, heavy or weighty. Uh, I know that's about the commandments of God are not weighty or burdensome. Uh, but of course, the commandments of God are meant to teach us to love our brother. So do you think that would, it's a, an apt, uh, uh, you could sing that song while you're meditating on that passage? First of all. <laughs> These questions are just so simple for Mateen to ask. <clears throat> Thanks, Mateen. He makes this comment about the messianic secret. And this is a scholar's way of talking about the fact that Jesus reveals himself in a puzzling way, doesn't he? Instead of just putting his shoulders back and telling people who he is, he, he doesn't do that. He doesn't claim to be the son of God he chooses a term, son of man. Nobody knows what that term means. And it's a, it's a nebulous term. It doesn't have any handholds on it. And I think he tries to do that exactly for what you have said. He chooses a term that doesn't have that doesn't register within the minds of its hearers a set of reactions and responses. He chooses a nebulous term and fills it with his experience, his content, his teaching, himself. And I think this is also true with love. Uh, perhaps in our day, the word love is used for so many different things that are not Christian love, we have to be more careful of this, but my guess is that even in the ancient world, love, because it's always fairly closely associated with sexuality, and sexuality is one of the most easily pervertible aspects of human life, is hard to understand. It makes sense to be careful with such words so that you've got a base of information before you introduce those words so those words can be understood. And I, say, I think we see this so often in the experience of Christ. We are, Jesus exhibits for us by what he does, who he is. but he does not tell us who he is first. Aha, now I understand. 
I hope that's a little help. I have a, I've got a question right here, and then I'll get up to you, yeah. O. <clears throat> so at the beginning of your talk, you, you challenged the AI definition of love that connected it to affection and feeling. And I agree that love is more than affection and feeling, but it's not not affection and feeling, right? And that's the limit on past speakers asking questions. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I think there are aspects <clears throat> of following Christ. that challenge to the utmost our affection and feelings. When I uh, was a pastor here, a friend of Janie's and mine, Corey Ten Boom, was in town, and we had her come and speak at this church. Got to know her when we lived in Europe named our daughter after her. Corey tells a story about this. She was in a concentration camp, and when she was liberated, she said to God, God, I will go anywhere in the world and speak to anyone you want, except I will never go back to Germany. Now, this is just an editorial comment there. I would advise you not to tell God <laughs> there's something you won't do. Because I don't know if it's a sense of humor or a character flaw, but he takes that as an irresistible challenge. <laughs> and you probably will lose. About four or five years after she made that statement, she found herself preaching in Munich, Germany, about the love of God. Now, she was in real trouble in Germany and on that subject. And when she was finished from her talk, a man that she did not recognize came up to her and said, how grateful I am for your message, Fräulein Ten Boom, to think that Christ has washed away my sin. And as she looked up, she saw, noticed that he had been a guard in her Ravensbrück, when she had had to undress and she was and her sister were mocked by him. And Corey said, I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of charity or forgiveness. I prayed, Jesus, I cannot forgive a man I hate. Give me your forgiveness. Now, it seems to me that this is an example, and I agree, it's a very extreme example, but I think that those of us who try to take this commandment seriously, love your enemy or love your neighbor as yourself, really have to face the reality that we are going to be called to do something to another person that we will not feel like we want to do. There will be a, be a serious battle there. How can there not be? Mm -hmm. 
we're human. And Corey says this, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And I, I think there are times when we simply cannot love with agape love that we are asked. We have to receive that from Christ or else we will not have it. And this is what Corey said. I extended my hand to this man and from my shoulder along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him. While into my heart came a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness. And I wonder if we couldn't add there the word love, that the world's healing hinges, but on Christ's. When God tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with a command, the love itself. And perhaps that's our answer, that we are forced to receive from Christ the very love that he demands of us. Are we not? Okay. Finished? Okay. <laughs> one, one last question. Oh, did you have, you had a question. It's an observation and uh, it, it can be put in the form of a formula. Okay. That faith is an educated bet. You don't just blindly say, yes, I believe. Science is an educated bet. Life is an educated bet. John the Baptist was curious about Jesus and he sent two disciples to him to ask him, are you the Messiah? And how did he answer? Go and tell John what you are seeing and hearing from experience. I'm done. <laughs> the reason I have to ask is I tend to jump in too soon, as my husband will tell you. Um, anyway, first of all, uh, this concludes our Linton Lecture Series, and I'd like for us to show our appreciation to um, Mateen, to Tim, to Brad, and to Jim for what they have given to us. Thank you.